Um, welcome here. I'm, I'm very glad to see so many people in here. Um, and, and I'm also glad to see that um, there's not a lot of sunglasses on and not a lot of people holding their heads from last night. Um, so, yeah, welcome. Okay, so what we're talking about today is um, the cyber terrorism and, and cyber warfare kind of thing. Um, a lot have been said about, you know, cyber terrorism. Um, there's a lot of stuff that, that, that can be said about it. Um, there's a lot of people that say cyber terrorism is not a reality today um, and that we don't really know that it can be effective. So, so what we're trying to do here today is not answer that question, um, but rather um, find out if there's a way um, to build a little bit of a framework that we can use to, um, to, to make these kind of attacks more effective. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, um, you know, people say, you know, a packet can't fly a plane, so um, cyber terrorism isn't really uh, something that will instill um, terror in people. And, and I tend to agree with it. You know, it's easier to blow up a building than to, to have a, a, a nicely coordinated kind of attack. Um, typically what we're seeing today with, with um, uh, w w when you start reading about cyber terrorism, that kind of thing, typically what you're seeing today is people talking about denial of service attacks. So they're saying, yeah, you know, we can, we can DOS the whole um, network of the, the internet. Um, and and the other and the the other kind of approach that they have is saying, well, we can break into, let's say, a power grid of a um, of a large uh, energy provider, and thereby disabling the power, or we can or we can act in some way and, and do some stuff there, um, and affect critical kind of infrastructure. Now, now to me, okay, um, now to me that's that's kind of I don't know, it's it's not really. Um, it's not really that effective for, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, there's a lot of companies and, and, and manufacturers and, and, and sectors, business sectors, that kind of thing, that, that doesn't rely that much on the Internet being up and running, correct? I mean, if you DOS, uh, let's say, uh, Ford uh, um, a motor car manufacturer, they're still going to have cars um, coming out of the production line if they're not connected to the internet. They don't need to ping an IP address in order to generate a car. Um, so, so really when you take the network down, you're really just only affecting maybe um, the fact that they can't send porn anymore around uh, and, they can't, and they can't chat to their friends on MSN. Um, you, you're not really affecting something um, internal to that company. Um, so, so, so that's a, the first thing with um, denial of service attacks. Um, Whoa, dude, you're jumping ahead. <clears throat> okay, um, the, the, um, the, 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 the second kind of attack that says we can break into a network and we can disable, let's say, the power grid for a specific area. Um, while I think that is, dude, you're jumping ahead. Um, um, so it's, so. <laughs> um, Okay, so, so 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 the problem with breaching the perimeter, I think it's, it it could maybe be possible to to breach a a, a critical kind of um, infrastructure perimeter and, and and possibly disable some kind of power grid somewhere. Um, what you need to keep in mind there is that there's a lot of redundancy in these systems. Okay, um, if you look at power providers in America, there's you know there's hundreds of of electrical power suppliers, um, and they can switch between different kind of um, setups quite easily. So, so the only way that you're going to make that effective is if you have like um, 6,000 hackers, and we have 6,000 people here at DEF CON, so that's an interesting number, um, hack into all of these networks at the same time effectively and, 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 and coordinated. Um, and, I, and I don't see that happening quite soon. Um, the, okay, um, all right. Um, so, 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 so I don't see that happening quite soon. And, and what you must realize is in some cases, um, the control systems of these critical infrastructures is air-gapped from the, the rest of the IP network, okay? So they don't connect the two together. Um, so, so it starts to become a little bit um, difficult to actually coordinate some kind of a strike um, that will really have an impact on, on, the, on the country as such. Um, so if we look at the... No, go back. So if we look at the if we look at the kind of attacks, 
the denial of service attack on the one end and the breaching of the perimeter on the other end, um, we see, first of all, you know, it does not hurt enough if we do a denial of service attack. And, uh, and, if, we, and if we breach the perimeter, it's, it's not going to be that effective. So, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so what we need, um, what we really need is attacks that are, that are very kind of focused towards a, a specific industry or a specific um, country, um, really nicely targeted. It must be closely coordinated, which means we want to see um, all of this happening at the same time. Um, when you, if you um, blow up a building, um, it doesn't help if you want to destroy a building. It does not help if you take one brick every day and move it away. You know, after a while... After, after a while, you know, people are going to like find out that you're taking away one brick at a time. And after the couple of few days, they're going to say, you know, you can't take this building away. You have to have it in one go. You have to get the thing destroyed in one go. And the same with this kind of thing. You need to have something that is, that is nicely coordinated and that happens at the same time. You also want it wide enough so it can really cripple a, a, a country or, or have a, a make a dent in the um, economic kind of infrastructure. Um, in a country, um, you need it to be effective, so it needs to run um, very, very kind of targeted, very quick. Um, it needs to work all the time. Um, and, the, and, the, and the last part that's very um, important for us, it needs to be um, very fast. Okay? Um, we don't want to have people being able to stop this thing once it's started, it, it needs to run real, real quick. Okay? And the only way that we're going to get that working is by doing it. By doing it automated, okay. So we're saying too too fast for human um, intervention. Um, we need it automated. So when we when we're looking at something that's automated, the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, next slide, is is a really nasty kind of worm, okay. So I want to talk about a worm um, quickly. Um, what we find is that external networks perimeters are actually quite difficult to breach, right? Okay, there's firewalls in there, you've got IDS in there, there's all sorts of interesting technology that's available today that makes it very difficult to break through an uh, external network. While if you look at the internal network, um, you find that normally the internal network is like soft and cozy, right? There's a whole lot of vulnerabilities around there um, that we can find um, and that we can exploit. And the reason for that is that... Um, System administrators tend to not patch machines that are internal. They say, um, we know about the, let's say, the, the, the RPC vulnerability that was found a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we don't have anything that's internet facing. Um, so the vulnerability really does not matter to us that much. Um, and, that, and, that's probably, and that's probably true um, for, for a lot of the, the problems that you see nowadays. What you find also is that when there's a vulnerability that, that um, uh, affects a, a kind of a, a package that is internet-facing, system administrators tend to patch only the stuff that is internet-facing, and the internal machines never get patched. A second reason for this is, is, is that people add new machines. Okay, so they add a whole lot of machines to the network. Um, those machines never go through a proper QA process. Um, and so we're sitting with a whole lot of machines internal um, that, are quite, that are quite weak. Um, the other thing to realize that's very, very important is that an internal network is highly, uh, uh, is, is likely not to be segmented. Okay, so an internal network on a network level is flat. There's no firewalls in, in the internal network. Um, and later on, we will see why that is really helping us a lot. So, so what you're really looking for is that, uh, what, what I'm really saying is that uh, a worm that can carry a, a couple of different um, payloads in terms of exploits will really make a kind of a killing on an internal net. So, so let's have a look and see what, what we have. Thanks, Shal. Um, OK, so, so we're looking at something like, uh, and th these are really kind of low-hanging fruit um, exploits um, and problems. You're looking at something like your good old Unicode, double decode, um, MDAC, you're looking at dot printer, dot ADI, web dev, um, and then, and then some stupid stuff like it's it's not even a a, a, a problem. Uh, it's not a vulnerability in the software, but it's really a configuration problem. Okay, so um, SQL, uh, MS, uh, Microsoft SQL running with a blank SA password, local local administrators with a um, 
uh, that, that has a blank uh, a password and sharing C, C dollar out there. Um, we think of things like uh, Slammer, which was the um, SQL locator service problem in that. Um, you got the Apache chunk encoding stuff, OpenSSL. You know, there's a whole lot of different exploits and, and a whole lot of different problems out there that we really know. We know how to code them. We know what they are. And we know how they sit together. Um, and, but, these, but these problems have been, to a large extent, being solved um, on, the, uh, on the Internet and, and, and on the perimeters. But in the internal networks, these, these kind of problems are, are quite big. Large and, and we know that they are there. And anyone running a, a, a anyone here that's an administrator that's got a large network will 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 know that these are problems in your internal network. Okay. Okay. So so one of the things when you're writing a worm to look at is actually um, finding more food. What we call it, um, saying that we want to be able to find new machines to attack. And um, so. When you're looking at an internal network, it's, it's quite uh, another story to get IP addresses there than to get IP addresses on the Internet. Um, and, it's, and it's quite easier to find IP addresses on an internal network. So, so we're quickly going to have a look and see um, what there is available to, to, um, to find more food. Um, first of all, uh, the easiest thing that you can do is you can simply look at your IP address and then look at the net mask. If you see your IP address being 10, 15, 17, 2, and your net mask 255000, you know that you've got a whole class A network there that's just about you know, all nice and flat, and you immediately got a whole lot of targets that you can look at. The second thing that we can do is we can start looking at, um, we can start looking at SNMP, um, and we can basically go through the ranges that we now found in the first instance, um, send SNMP queries to all of those machines, see you respond. Um, we tried with a community um, name of, let's say, Public and Cisco and the company name or whatever, um, and, and we extract the roots, or ha as you call it, the routes um, of these machines, and we easily find all the other networks that's sitting on, on that internal network. The third, we, the third thing we can do, and, and as we progress in here, you know, it kind of the, the effectiveness of these methods um, is, is, is really kind of you know, going down a bit. Um, we can do a trace route to the internet. Um, we can record the routes um, and, and, and see you know, what kind of hops we find there to find out networks that are surrounding, surrounding um, the net where we are at the moment. And, and that is given that the, um, that the IP address where we're executing from is really internal to the network. So just now we're going to see how we're going to get this thing internal to the network. I know it's annoying when this thing goes on and off. It's annoying to me as well. Um, okay, this, the, third, the fourth thing that we can do is we can start just basically doing ping sweeps around the network and find out what's available. So we go one class, or one class C higher, one class C lower. We do a ping sweep. We look at the response times going back. Um, and from the response times, we can have a good indication if that machine is sitting on a local network or not. And then last of all, if, if, we're really, you know, uh, uh, if we're really getting desperate, then we can start doing a brute force and actually try to uh, um, just run through a couple of IP numbers, ping them, and see what we come up. That's not really effective, but you know, I thought it'd be nice if I put that in there. Okay, so so let's look at it, uh, at the next thing. I don't know if you can see if you can see there um, on on the screen quite nicely. Um, the the one thing that's interesting for internal networks um, is when you look at denial of service attacks. The, the types of denial of service attacks that you can find on internal networks are, 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 are very much uh, more kind of sophisticated, and there's, uh, there's a couple of more choices that you can have when you're doing denial of service on internal networks than on external networks. Okay, so if I think about it real quick, um, you must realize that um, worms that you have on internal networks propagate at wire speeds, okay? So, so you've seen what Slammer, for instance, does to your Cisco boxes, right? Slammer didn't have a, 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 a dedicated denial of service um, payload, um, but because it propagated that quick and because it was sitting on an internal network, it was flooding your network to the extent that some of the routers went down. So when we're starting um, to, to build really um, denial of service uh, attack tools that are dedicated to, to propagated wire speeds, um, and really dedicated to do flooding um, on wire speeds, I think we can get some more interesting um, kind of numbers 
out there than with something that didn't have a, a dedicated denial of service um, payload. Um, something else that we can do on internal networks that we can't do on external networks is ICMP um, root redirection. We can start playing with um, the the op tables of, of machines in internal, something you can't do um, on the internet because you're not local to the network. You can start doing some trickery on the, on the MAC addresses, like assign every IP address to your MAC address. Um, there's a couple of things we can do there. We can do um, DHCP at least um, exhaustion attacks, whereby we um, basically emulate the DHCP server until all the leases have expired. Um, and there's a couple of things that we can do on the internal network that's really bad, okay? Um, you know what happens when you choose your IP address to be the same as your firewall. Um, you know, the whole, the whole damn subnet goes down. Um, we can even do something on a, on a network where we can, where if we can sniff the traffic, that we can do um, hijacking of TCP connections. That's not that effective, but in an unswitched kind of network, um, it could do wonders. Um, and, and while we're there, while we're sitting on the machine itself, uh, we, can, we can somehow start and delete files. So we can corrupt all the doc files on the machine, all the XLS files. Uh, we can look for zip files, insert some bytes into the zip file, thereby corrupting it. We can see if we can flash uh, the, the BIOS of the machine um, so that when someone reboots the machine, all the BIOS settings are lost. Um, we, can, we can do pop-up messages all around on all the machines that's been affected, thereby, um, let's say with a pop-up message of something like, um, you, your machine has been infected, please contact your system administrator and read the following 25 characters to your system administrators. And then you put in the A0, $2, whatever. The reason for that is that it's basically going to disable the help desk to the extent that the PABX will be flooded um, and you're really going to keep your administrators quite busy. Um, something else that we can do is we can look at the, the routers that's surrounding the network, okay? Um, and we can have a, a module that will try to log into the routers and thereby disable, uh, and disable all the interfaces on the machine itself. Um, I know there's no default password for Cisco boxes, but, you know, some of the other 3Com switches, um, some, some of that stuff has got default passwords. You can, you can kind of guess passwords and see if you can actually get into the machine and, and disable the interfaces. Um, what will happen then is that your administrator won't be able to get to the affected machines at all, uh, um, at all and they need to physically go to the router and, and you know, plug a cable in there. Now imagine, you know, it doesn't sound that bad, but if you think about a network with like 50,000 machines on there, um, and, and let's say, you know, 1,000, 2,000 different um, routers, it, it starts to become a little bit of a nightmare. Okay, okay so, so I know you can't see a lot there because it's a little bit too light in here, but that's, that's typically what a design of such an um, internal worm would look like. Uh, we got basically three modules. Um, the first module does the reconnaissance. Um, the second module does the um, actual exploitation, and the third module in there does the denial of service. Now, um, of course, the one thing to keep in mind here is that denial of service attacks and, and, and a kind of biological agent that propagates through the network does not match very well. Okay, so so if, if, if you have an instance of this worm starting off doing denial of service attack straight away, you might disable the whole of the network, and it means you're not going to propagate into all the machines that you need to. You can understand what I'm saying. On the one end, you have someone that's killing everyone. At the other end, you want to infect everyone. Those two things, they don't work together quite well. So we worked out a kind of a model um, to, to, to get that right. Okay? Um, whereby we define something as a, we define a machine as a neighbor. Now, remember what I said, the network is flat, okay? So if the network is flat, we can get communications between different instances of this worm going. And that makes it very interesting for us. Um, we'll, we'll put something on the website um, on sensepost.com that would, that would uh, explain exactly how we're going to do that. I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail of that now. It's quite, quite um, intricate. Um, if you're interested, you can you know, ask me, ask me um, afterwards. I'm just watching the time as well. I've got a lot more that I want to show you. Okay, so, so now we talked about this thing, this, this uber kind of worm, 
And, and, if we, and if we run it somewhere, it's going to take out everything in its way. But how do we get it into the internal network? <clears throat> well, um, it's actually much, much easier than you think it is. Uh, I'm not going to show you any kind of zero-day silent delivery in um, Outlook or any, any of that. Um, what you do is um, you, you use the correct language. Okay, so if, you, if you're attacking a French kind of company, you write your email in French. Um, and you mail it from marketing at and the company name that you have uh, with a subject that says new screensaver for company name. Click here. And then, uh, and then you don't really attach the, the, um, the EXE to the mail because your content level filter is going to pick it up and going to shut it out. Um, but you, you, send a, um, you send a link. To the, to the actual EXE, and you make sure that that EXE is located on a site that supports HTTPS, you know, that, that's SSL enabled. Um, the reason for that is easy. Um, if, we, uh, if we put something on a site that is um, that's setting up, well, what's going to happen? Your browser is going to set up an encrypt, encrypted tunnel to, uh, encrypted session to that web server, thereby all your, your content level stuff is not going to pick up what's going past the wire. You could be surfing porn, or you could be downloading this um, nasty exe um, and what we do is we also put a um, we, we kind of obfuscate the, the the URL so we call it intranet.companyxxx.com and then we have a little at sign there and then we put a in hex we encode the rest of the uh, the rest of the URL that's the actual URL obviously you know um, that the part in front of the at sign is actually a username that's being passed on and and the part behind the at sign is the real site. Now you know this, right? But your marketing department, they do not know this. And your in and, and the and the kind of management department, management structure, they don't know it either. And sales oh shit, they don't know anything. <laughs> um, okay, so so um, so you might say, well, this is really not that, that effective, and, and I don't see this really working. Well, I'll ask you this. You, you, all of you get a whole lot of spam messages, you know, um, uh, and, and you delete it, right? You delete it without even looking at the content, correct? But if you were to get an email that, that's coming from marketing at your company name, it's got your company name in there, coded perfectly in there, and it says new screensaver for your company name, perfectly spelled okay, and it's in your language that you speak, then you're probably going to have a look at it, right? You, you might not execute the stuff because you people here are, are more kind of um, security aware. But it's actually a nice way of getting it in there. So let's look at stats. So, so we wanted to do this and see what it would get to. Um, and we couldn't really find someone that would let us test it. So, <laughs> so, so at the end of the day, so at the end of the day, we, we, we got a bank in South Africa that, that allowed us to send it to the security team. Okay, it's 13 people of the security team. Um, now, here's the stats. Because we, <laughs> because, because, <laughs> because we, w w the, the payload that we sent in this, in this case was a modified um, version of the um, Trojan that we talked about last year. Um, and, 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 and what it basically did is it pulled out the username um, of the environment and then it reported the username to, to us. Okay? So we can see exactly who was um, downloading the thing and we can exactly see who executed this thing. So here's the stats. 13 people, we mailed 13 people in the group. Eight of them downloaded the EXE. We can see that in our Apache logs, right? They clicked on the thing. Um, and five of them executed it. Now, because we had this specialized payload, it didn't really do anything. It was just like, you know, sending out the username back to us. So the one guy, like, clicked on it three times. He really wanted that screensaver. Okay, now, you appreciate that when we do this in a large company, we only need one person to be able to open that mail. Uh, well, to basically download that thing and open it, correct? And I know you're going to sell, uh, you, you're going to say, well, you know, the... Um, the EXE itself was sitting on a site that's SSL enabled. It's, the the browser is going to complain about this thing. Um, I know, but people go like, um, you know, the browser goes, uh, the, certif uh, the certificate that's presented to you was signed by an unknown authority. Now, okay, um, you're going to download the EXE now. Do you really want to run it? Yes. Um, th that's the way it works. So you don't need a zero day to get the stuff in there. You simply need to sound convincing. 
Okay, so now we got this way of basically, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this real quick. Uh, we got a way to basically find um, male people at a company. How do we find someone at a company name? You have a friend, you don't know where they are. You go to Google, right? You put in the company name in there, um, and you see if you can find if that person ever emailed anything. So if we do um, if we do a Google for at companyxxx.com minus www.company.companyxxx.com and we scrape it, we basically take all the, the the results coming back and we extract all the email addresses. It works really nice. Now, for example, I, I used uh, uh, some kind of newspaper, Hari Yet newspaper in Turkey, just as an example. Uh, you run it and you get um, a, um, 83 different email addresses of people. Now, these are people that typically ever emailed any forum, um, ever mailed to a, a news group or to a mailing list or uh, signed a, a, a guest book or this. But those email addresses exist. They sit there on the internet. They can be mined. This is how you get all your junk mail, through people that does the same thing and then send you junk mail. So be, we're basically just doing a kind of an interesting, interesting spam exercise here. Okay. So now we want to make it a little bit more um, wider. So we want to look at the, we want to look at a whole country, right? Okay. So what we do is we said we can extract email addresses from companies. Now all we need to do is we need to find the companies, correct? We need to find all these different companies. And we're going to target the following sectors within a, within a country. We're going to uh, look at telecom. We're going to look at all the different energy providers, hydro, um, oil, um, nuclear, fossil fuel, that kind of thing. We're going to look at government and military. Right, okay. Um, we're going to look at media providers. Why are we going to look at media providers? The reason we look at media providers is you all love the press, right? You do something small, they make it into something big. So... As part of the kind of hysteria that we want to generate with this kind of attack, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to attack the press as well. And once the press is attacked, they're going to say, you know, this is the end of the world, right? We, we can just, you know, go and you know, hide in our bunkers because they kind of always make things bigger than it really is. Um, we're looking at the financial services, banks, insurance companies, that kind of thing. Uh, we look at prominent businesses, and the reason we look at prominent businesses is that in some countries, the 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 the, 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 the let's say 60 or 70 or 80 percent of that of the country's GDP is 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 generated by one company. Um, so we want to find that one company and take it out as well. And we look at emergency services in the online demo that we're showing you just now. We're not looking at emergency services, and we look at transport. And for transport, we look at airlines and we look at railway. Okay, so <clears throat> how do you find companies or, or, or departments within these different sectors? Um, well, let's split it up in private, uh, the private sector and the public sector. The private sector um, is actually quite difficult to find. Um, you, can't go to, you can't go to Google and say, give me all the top companies, um, give me all the telecom companies in this country. The online directories just doesn't work that well. So the way to go there is to actually find specialized directories. So you can go to Google, you type in there, give me um, a list of uh, telecom companies uh, in a certain country, um, and you will find that there's one list that lists all the telecommunications companies um, in the world. And there's another list that lists all the um, uh, airlines in the world. With the, what we need is obviously we need the domain, right, the DNS domain. So it would say this airline, that domain, that kind of thing. Um, some you need to do online, okay, so you need to query them online because there's not one big page where you can get everything off. Um, so you basically have to go in, click on the thing, click on that thing, and at the end of the time, uh, at the end of the day, you get the result back. And for that, we need a little poll script that will interrogate the website as we go along. For some of the others, we can have, um, we can have a nice uh, situation where we um, have one big page with all the companies listed in there um, per country, and we basically take that and we download it to our site and build a little database. Okay? There's pros and cons to both of them. Um, in terms of a static list, your, your, your cons, um, there are that, that if a new company starts doing business in the telecommunication sector in, let's say, Albania, you're not going to know about it, right? Um, because you have a static list. Um, on the other end, the, the kind of more online lists have problems that um, if that list is down, then, you know, the, you can't get the information out there. 
Um, and it's basically a single point of failure for that particular um, sector. So the challenge is, um, in some cases, you will find, let's say on Business Day or one of these kind of um, newspapers, you will find a list of the top um, 100 companies within a country. Okay? Mm. But they only give the company name, and you've got to map that to a domain name. Um, and to do that is quite difficult. So you have company name, and you have a country name, and you want to have the domain name. Now, we basically figured out a way to do that with about, I would say, 75% accuracy. Um, it's, it's in the paper. Um, I'm sure the paper's on the CD. Did anyone have a look? Um, okay. There's a, is, is it? Okay, excellent. Okay, the paper for this is on the CD as well. And if you want to find out how we actually got to that, let's say, 90, 75, 90% accuracy with that, um, the algorithm and all of that is right there in the paper. Okay, when we look at the public sector, uh, we're basically looking at, at government and military, right? Um, and, and here's where it starts to become a little bit more interesting. Um, we all know that, there's, um, that most of the countries have for government, let's say, .gov, .za. Right. Um, the the problem here is that not all of the countries have uh, actual .gov. Like France, for instance, have .gov. Um, that's the that's the sub TLD for government. Okay, so we can find that out. It takes a while, but after a while, you kind of find all the different uh, government sub TLDs that there are. Some countries don't have it. Uh, Germany, for instance, I don't think has a .gov. .de as such. Maybe you can help me out, all the German hackers that's in here. Um, okay, so what we, what we can do now, remember we have this Google scraper that will basically go through um, uh, the internet and find out email addresses within a specific um, department, uh, uh, within a specific domain. So if we basically scrape, um, uh, if we basically scrape uh, gov.za for instance, okay, we're going to find a whole lot of different sub-departments um, sitting within gov.za itself. And we can then take those sub-departments, let's say it says energy, there's someone mailing from in it something something, uh, someone, let's make it Pete, at server1.energy.gov.za. Okay, what do we know about that email address? First of all, we know um, that energy is now a department within gov.za, right? So now we can scrape for energy.gov.za again and find out all the different subdomains in there. And this we can do recursively until we basically found out all the different blocks, all the different blobs of, uh, of domain names within a specific TLD. Right, when we do the demo, you'll see how it works. We can do the same for military as well. The problem for military, though, um, is that um, a lot of the military domains are actually contained within government domains. So we, so we can't get, we, we have to, uh, for instance, you will see a domain called um, mod.com.my, which is um, Ministry of Defense for Malaysia. Okay? Um, no, no, that would be mod.gov.my, sorry. Okay, mod.gov.my. Um, and that's basically the whole of the defense department in, the, in terms of IP space being, being, being put into the government, um, the government um, sub-TLD. So what we've done at the end of this whole thing is we've also done a little bit of our footprinting algorithms. Anyone was uh, uh, at Black Hat Seattle or in Black Hat Amsterdam would know that we've been doing a whole lot of work on footprinting as well and, and basically converting these domains into IP addresses. If you want to go for an external attack, you know, you would want to have those IP addresses in there as well. Um, so as a kind of an afterthought, we also put a, a little module in there that once you have the domain, you can do the, the footprint in terms of the IP address. Okay? And <coughs> we know that people love GUIs. Okay? So we got a graphical user interface for this thing. Um, we, actually, um, we actually didn't want to do it, but, but then, you know, at the end of the day, um, this is the thing that really sells. So <laughs> we're not selling this. Um, so what I want to show you quickly is the um, the graphical user interface for this for this um, little thing that we built. Um, the first thing you can see there, if you scroll down, is that you have an updated kind of a sun map of the world. 
And the reason for that is simply because if you are attacking a certain country, um, you want it to be daylight over there, right? Why? Because people tend to read more email during the day. And now you can see exactly, you know, when the sun is coming up in your country of target, and you can say, okay, you know, now is a good time to start the attack. And then at the bottom there, you would see there's a couple of, um, a couple of uh, continents that we can choose from. So let's just go to North America. Okay, and we got our little North American thing in there. Um, I want you to, to go to, um, oh, let's go to the United States for now. Um, and here you have different types of industries that you now can select. Um, what I want you to do, Charles, is, is I want you to go to um, prominent businesses, select prominent businesses for me, select uh, government, and select military. Um, okay. Okay, now what it's doing now is it's basically taking the prominent businesses out of the database. Um, and in terms of the, and what I want to show you there, um, Shal, if you can scroll down a little bit, is that for some of the companies, we don't know exactly what that domain name is going to be. Okay? Um, let's, let's, um, let's take, for instance, um, um, American International. If you go down a bit. You'll see that, it's, that there's a couple of domains that it tried to actually resolve that to. Um, some of the stuff is more easier to find. Some of it is a little bit more difficult to find. Okay, if you go down all the way. Okay, so those are all the major um, businesses in America. And we can select all of them basically with one little click. Um, and, it will, and it will go on. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, just go back. Just go back. Okay, and there we see all the different government departments that, we've now, that we now extracted. So you see there, um, uh, cdc.gov, dest.gov, doc.gov, doe.gov. I don't even know what all those acronyms are. Um, but we can extract them, right? Um, we also got the embassies in there just for fun, um, all the American embassies and the domains associated with them. Um, and if we go down to the bottom, you will see there we get to the, um, we get to the military. And those are departments that we found. Um, in, in the military space, that, so that's a dot mall space in there. Um, so you see AF, which I guess is Air Force, um, Defense Link, DZR, DLL, whatever, Navy dot mall, and you see that Pentagon dot mall as well. So if you can click on Pentagon for me, and and click on email. Okay, so what it's doing now, it's basically going through through Google and extracting email addresses that's potential targets for for people that's got an ad address at, at the pentagon.mall. Um, we can obviously do it with um, with any of the any of the domains that we want there. Um, it's taking a while, I see. You must realize that on the back end, there's a whole lot of different things happening now. Okay, there we go. So there you see a whole lot of email addresses um, for people at, at, at Pentagon. What I want to show you there, which is interesting, is that you see there's subdomains within the Pentagon as well. So you have OSD, you have AF, you have um, hqda.army.pentagon, um, there's um, js.pentagon. Okay, so we can do that recursively and now again zoom in onto that one little subdomain and see if we can extract email addresses from that again. Okay, um, so when we select when we select these email addresses and we click on email at the bottom, it's now basically going to send a customized message to all of these people saying, you know, here's a little link, uh, click on it, and you can install the new Pentagon screensaver. Um, and, and you actually just need one of them to click on it, and it will basically then crawl within that space over there and try to do as much damage as possible. Um, if you can just click on back, uh, if you know, if you, you can just go back, um, go back again, go back again, um, go down. Uh, if we can get South America up there, South America. Okay, um, here's South America. Um, if you can click on Venezuela, 
Okay, we're going to go for telecom providers in Venezuela. Okay, we see there's two main telecom providers there, Digital and something I can't pronounce. Um, if, you go to, if you go to Digital and you click on Footprint, okay, what it's going to do now, it's the back end, it's going to implement a couple of algorithms in there that's now going to try to um, determine what IP addresses are associated with Digital in Venezuela. Do we have anyone from Venezuela here? No? Okay, cool. Um, what I want you to tell, uh, what I want want to tell you that's really important is that the stuff is not live. Okay, um, it doesn't work. Um, just give it a give it a give it a bit. Did it time out? Okay, it time it it actually timed out on the it timed out on the on the Mac, um, which is a which is a pity because otherwise you would see exactly the DNS names and the different IP addresses associated with. Um, oh, okay. Okay, now that, now, okay, guys, okay, stop attacking us. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so there we go. So, so there you see, I think that screen is a little bit more clear than this screen. Um, there you see all the IP addresses associated with, um, with this particular organization um, and, the, um, and, the, and the DNS names. Um, Charles, if you click on, on, on that IP address over there. No, the other one. <laughs> it's okay. 90. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. Okay, I see Geek Tools has just moved their thing, their little um, proxy, who's proxy in a, in the matter of days. Yesterday or two days ago, it was still up. But with 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 these IP addresses, once you have them, you can actually then see exactly what block belongs to them. Um, if we can go back to the slides. Okay. So in conclusion. Um, I think focus kind of cyber attacks are quite possible. Um, I think it can happen. I'm very scared to call it terrorism because there's a whole lot of words associated with terrorism that, that I don't think is really what we're going to achieve over here. But at least the one thing we can say is that focus kind of attacks are seriously possible. Um, and that once we've implemented something like this, we would li we highly likely have a negative impact on that network. How does it compare to real life attacks? Um, I don't know if this is this would instill as much terror as you know a kind of conventional attack, which is really horrible. Um, and what's the chances of this happening? The one thing I want to I want to really press here is that everything that you've seen here today is not difficult to put together, right? There's no zero day in there. There's no there's no kind of um, super technique in here to get this stuff running. So all of this is really quite easy to to put together. Um, and should we worry? Well, I think as networks and as critical systems are becoming more and more connected to the internet, and and as as, as control systems are becoming more connected to internal networks, um, this would be you know this becomes a, a much bigger problem for us. Um, Nowadays, we tend to say, well, let's air gap the, the critical systems um, with the internet, which is cool, right? We do that. But we don't air gap our internal systems with critical systems. Um, people tend to think, tend to think about um, cyber terrorism and, and, and cyber attacks more and more along the lines of we have to breach the perimeter and get through the perimeter, and then we can do stuff. Um, and because our perimeters are safe, it's all right. Uh, while the internal networks suffer suffer uh, muchly, I think the, the 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 answer to this kind of um, problem at the end of the day would be five minutes. Okay, I'm I'm almost done here. Um, at the end of the day, the answer to this thing would be would be really to um, educate your users, right? Um, if you throw more firewalls at this problem, the problem is not going to go away. If you throw more technology to this, it's really not going to go away. But if you educate your users not to click on a little link, you know, then, then you're really solving the core of the problem. Um, I thank you for your time, and I hope it was um, interesting. Thanks. Um, okay.